Well, good morning, church. So we are in the middle of our summer road trip series in which we are looking at different stops that Paul makes along the way on his missionary journeys and what those stops can tell us today about, about Jesus, about how we live as Christians, about our faith. Uh, last week, uh, Kyle talked about Paul's vision in Acts 16. And from that vision, we learned that although sometimes we make plans for the future, it ultimately is God that determines those steps we take to get to that future. And today we're going to look at another stop, another story that Paul, um, that Paul has uh, when he goes to Athens. Okay? Paul goes to Athens in Acts 17. If you want to turn your Bibles there now, you're welcome to turn there and follow along with the story. Now this message today, I will warn you, is going to be a little bit of a different style than maybe some of you are used to. I, I'm not sure um, how many... Different, uh, different sermons you've heard in this style, whether um, it was years ago, whether it's recently, uh, but we're going to do a little bit different today. We're going to give a sermon in the style of a first-person narrative. And if you don't know what a first-person narrative is, it's this. It's basically a retelling of the story from the point of view of, of a character that might have been there when the story took place. For example, if we're going to do a first-person narrative over uh, Moses and the burning bush, you could do a first-person narrative as Moses, but you also could do a first-person narrative as the sheep, right? And that's kind of how first-person narratives uh, kind of work. Um, in a first-person narrative, there are some liberties that you have to take um, because the text doesn't specifically say that. But if you are worried about that, I will say the liberties I have taken in this sermon today are rooted in extensive research, biblical and geographical allusions, and also some personal uh, experiences in the city of Athens. And so after I pray, I will take on the character of Dionysius. A little bit of background before we get there, though. Uh, Paul, after the vision in Acts 16, uh, him and his buddies, Silas and Timothy, they go to the city of Philippi. It is there in Philippi where Paul, Silas, and Timothy meet uh, the woman uh, Lydia. And there she uh, gets converted to Christianity. She, she becomes a believer in Jesus. And then she converts her whole family as well. But in Philippi, uh, Paul and Silas, they get arrested. They get put in prison. Um, and it is there in prison where they have this miraculous interceding by God that gets them released from prison. And because of this miracle, the jailer of that prison, along with his rest of the family, they also become followers of Christ. And so after they leave Philippi, they go uh, to two towns, Thessalonica and Berea. But in Thessalonica and Berea, there is some agitation, there's some turmoil, there's some kind of people who don't like Paul and his buddies spreading the gospel. And so they, they run him out of town. At least they run Paul out. Silas and Timothy, they decide to stay in Berea, and, and they send Paul away to the coastline in Athens. And that's where our story uh, picks up and takes place this morning in Acts 17. And so like I said, I will take on the character of this man named Dionysius. Why did I choose Dionysius? Well, at the end of Acts 17 in our story, he is one of two people specifically named as converts uh, from hearing Paul's message. Right? There's, there's two different converts that, that hear Paul's message that are specifically named at the end of our story. And one of those happens to be Dionysius. Now, there's not a lot of information around Dionysius about who he was before and who he was after the conversion. What we do know is that before the conversion, he was a judge on the Oropagus court. And what that means is people would come in with giant intellectual problems. He and uh, 29 other men, uh, 60 years plus, would go over those problems and they would discuss together about what to do with that person. Whether it was lawful for them to say this, whether it was unlawful. Um, and in Athens especially, there was a lot of different religions and gods to pray for. And so there was a lot of intellectual kind of standings to be on. And so Dionysius was on that Oropagus court. Now, after the conversion, some scholars have suggested that Dionysius went around with Paul from place to place around the, the city of Athens, uh, kind of spreading the good news of Jesus. Other scholars suggested that Dionysius was a part of the start of the church of Athens. But more than likely, what scholars have kind of settled on, and what church tradition has said, is that Dionysius was the bishop of the church in Athens. Not necessarily that he started the church, but that he was the bishop of the church in Athens. And so after I pray, I will take on this character, Dionysius, and you all will be my students on a normal church service back 
in 54 AD Athens. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can spread the good news of who you are, whether it be from a traditional sermon style or first person narrative, whatever it is, we just praise you that we can just talk about you openly and freely without fear. God, we, we come today, I don't know where your people are this morning, but we pray if those are hurting, this message might bring some healing. We pray for those who are in a state of fear that this message might bring some peace. We hope that those coming in today with these feelings of happiness leave even more joyful than they came. God, we know that you have the power to change lives into open hearts, and we ask that of you this morning. God, I also pray that you speak through me the gift of preaching, that I may speak your words to these, your people. Amen. Good morning, students. Have a seat. Those in the back, have a seat. Have a seat. I got an exciting, exciting piece of mail today. I got a letter from the Apostle Paul. I'm not sure if I've mentioned him before, but... But Paul sent us a letter, and I want to read it for you this morning. Can I do that? All right, here's the letter. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy for the church in Corinth, and together with all the saints in Achaia, grace and peace be with you by the way of Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, I don't know if I can keep reading. This is so exciting. I haven't, I haven't talked to Paul in, in so long. Have I ever told you how I got to know Paul? Have I told you how without Paul, maybe none of this would happen, us speaking Jesus together in Athens? On another note, have, have you ever had this, this sense of clarity before? Maybe it was like uh, when, your, when your ear uh, popped open and you can hear way better than you had before and you didn't even know that it needed popped. Yeah, that happened to me a couple years ago. It felt like my whole life was, was blocked by something. My heart was, was closed off from, from opening fully. And I, I don't know why I had that feeling and I don't know how that came about, but it just felt like something needed to change. And then I met Paul. So come, come back with me just, just a few short years ago. Every day was, was just like the other. I did the same things pretty much every single day. Each morning I'd, I'd wake up and man, I'd struggle to get out of bed. I don't know if it's because I didn't get enough sleep or more than likely it was the wine that I drank the night before. But either way, it was a struggle getting out of bed. And whenever I finally got up the nerve to get up, I got off the bed, went to my bedside table where I had a, had a shrine to the god Koyos, and I just began praying to Koyos. Koyos, give me the great insight that you have. You see, Koyos is the, the Greek titan and god of the mind. And me, I... I was an intellectual thinker. I was a man with with high education and with high thought. I was even a judge on the Oropagus Court, believe it or not. And I thought that all my prayers to Koyos granted me the insight, granted me the, the power to kind of decipher those thoughts that other people had, those kind of problems that other people came to me about. After my morning prayers with Koyos, I'd get up, I'd get dressed, sometimes I'd, I'd take a little bath, and then I'd make my way to the living area. And in the living area, there was three more uh, little tables, little, little altars that I made. The first one, I'd get on my knees and, and I'd pray to the god Tyche. I'd pray that all this luck from Tyche would rain down on me and there'd be no problems throughout the day. I'd shuffle my little feet over to the right and I'd pray to the god Plutus. I said, Plutus, grant me overflowing wealth and riches. And it seemed to work. 
I had a lot of money. I had a lot of wealth. I had a lot of things. And I thought maybe it's because I prayed so hard to Plutus that I got all these things. And so I kept praying to Plutus even, even more each day. And the last one, I'd shuffle my feet once again. And I'd pray to the God of my namesake, Dionysus. I didn't have to pray to him, but, but, but I felt like I, I kind of needed to. See, Dionysus was, was the God of fertility, and me and my wife, we were struggling. It was a lot of failed attempts to get pregnant. We lost a couple along the way. Maybe it was my fault because I was so old, but my wife was still so young, there, there should have not have been any problems. She wanted to quit. She wanted to give up. She wanted to just not try anymore. But I thought maybe if I just prayed to Dionysus a little bit harder, he could make us pregnant. Sometimes after crying, I'd, I'd stand up take a big deep breath and say, you got this, Dionysus. But it never worked. So I'd go to the kitchen. I'd grab some breakfast. It was usually some dates out of a bowl. And I'd make my way to the front door where I'd, or I'd open it. And the, this, it was so early in the morning that the sun was just peering over the Acropolis. Next to it, I could see the great spear of Athena cascading over the hills the, the early morning air was always so fresh and so, so cool and warm at the same time. Oh, I can still smell those fresh olives being pressed early in the morning for oil. You know, my walk to work was, was fairly typical. It was, I had to make my way through the, the marketplace early in the morning. And, and usually early in the morning, the marketplace wasn't full. It was just a couple of people setting up their stations, setting up their tables, uh, preparing their stuff to sell later in the day. It was quiet. I liked it. And so after going through the, the marketplace, I made my way to the Acropolis. And, and it was just around the corner of the Acropolis, up a few flights of stairs, where I made it to the Areopagus, which is the hill dedicated to Mars, where me and my fellow colleagues would, would talk all day, rambling, most people would say. And we, we just talked. It wasn't really in, in bad taste. It wasn't in poor taste. It was actually to, to, make us, to make us gain understanding of the world, make us gain understanding of what life means and, and maybe what life means after death. And really everything in between. Fielding cases for people that came in on the Oropagus throughout the day. And that was my routine. Every single day. For it seems like a long time. I know it was only just a short couple of years, but it seemed like forever. But one day it was different. I did something that I normally never do. It was much like every other day where I struggled to get out of bed, except this time I never got out. I fell back asleep and I woke up with the sun beaming down through the window of our bedroom and I was late. I was so, so late. And so I rushed out of bed. I, I propped up and, and ran to get everything together. I went so fast that I missed my prayers to Koyos. I got dressed. I, I missed my prayers to Tyche and Plutus and, and Dionysus. I even forgot to get dates out of the bowl. And I was going so fast in my haste, I, I even put my cloak on backwards. And I walked out the doors expecting that cool air <clears throat> from the morning and said I got rushed with the heat of the sun. I miss that fresh smell of olives being pressed as well. And I had a rush to the marketplace, rush as, as fast as I could. But when I got to the marketplace, it was a completely different story. 
There was people everywhere screaming at each other, wanting to buy and sell and trade all these different kind of goods, and I just wanted to get to work. You know, in my haste, I, I surprisingly noticed this man that was staring right up to the Parthenon, and he had this face of what I can only recall as a sheer anger. It was... It was odd to see. Maybe it was that, that Zeus or some other god didn't give him exactly what he asked for, and so he's staring at the Parthenon, trying to, to, trying to will it to his existence. He looked like a well-dressed, well-educated, well-groomed man. Maybe it was Athena that didn't give him exactly what he wanted. And so he's staring at the great statue of Athena, saying, please give me what I asked But whatever the case may be, whatever derived his anger, he was just beaded with sweat. And his face was was red. You can see the, the blood vessels popping from his neck from who knows how far away I was. He was really red. And I thought, well, I'm already late for work. What's a couple more minutes? Maybe I should ask if he's okay. Maybe I should ask and, and see whether or not I could, I could pray to Athena for him. And so I went up to the man and I said, hey, are you, are you okay? He just erupted in words. Words that, that I didn't even know what he was saying. Something along the lines of, of, of false gods, idols, and all this stuff in between. I didn't really know what he was saying. And so I, I backed off. I turned around and I said, I'm just going to go to work, I guess. So I made my way to the Acropolis through the the crowds of the marketplace. And then I heard his voice. His, His voice was a lot more focused this time. It was a lot more poignant. It, it, it cut through the crowd and it, and it made it, its way to my ears and I just stopped in my tracks. And something inside of me made me turn around. And I saw him with the crowds forming around him. So many people that he had to jump on top of some oil boxes to continue speaking. He started talking about this this new God he found. This God named Jesus? Maybe it was... Maybe it was from where he's from. Maybe it was a, a foreign god that, that hadn't made his way to Athens yet. That, that happens from time to time. But then he started talking more about Jesus. And then he started talking about Romans, which was weird because we're in Greece. And then he started talking about crucifixion, which happens all the time. And then started talking about something called Anastasis? Maybe he means Anastasia, the, the beautiful Greek goddess. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. Why would he be talking about two different gods here? In my confusion, I, I barely noticed that some Stoics and Epicureans were, were making their way through the crowds up to the man. And the Stoics shouted out some, some really harsh name calling. They called him a seed picker, they called him a babbler which pretty much means that they accused him of stealing some ideas and casting them off as his own. They wanted to make sure that he was saying everything in the right, and so they took the man. And before, I, before anything else got, got harder, I left. I, I couldn't say I ran to work, but it was, it was faster than a walk. And I made my way up the steps, made it to the Oropagus, and... All my colleagues were, were already sitting there rambling on about who knows what. And they all stopped to look at me and they, they asked me, where have you been, Dionysius? And I went to tell them a story. I went to tell them that I woke up late and I couldn't get out of bed. Then I had to make my way through the marketplace. Did I tell you that my coke was inside out? And then I heard this man and then I started telling him about the man that was speaking. And then all of a sudden we heard, the, <clears throat> we heard some crowds coming up behind us. We heard the dust coming up in the air. We saw it coming up over the cascading Oropagus. And the crowd got closer and closer and closer. And then they turned the corner 
excuse me, and there's this, the man. The, the, the man from the marketplace was, was coming up with those same Stoics and Epicureans. The philosophers, they motioned for us counsel to come over. And they, they asked us, they, well, they pretty much told us, I, I need you to examine this man for what he says. We don't know whether it's in the right standing of the law. We don't know what he's saying. We just need to make sure that it's all correct. And then they pointed at me. They said, yeah, him. A member on your council. Yeah, he, he was there in the marketplace just a few minutes ago. He can tell you all that he said. So the council all looks at me and the philosophers look at me and I, I don't know what to say. So I just say, yeah, I was, I mean, yeah, I was there, but let's just examine him, I guess. And so the philosophers take him to the, the judgment seat. All 30 of us, we, we take our seats in our council chairs. The philosophers kind of gather around on the outside of the hill. There's some crowds that are forming below just trying to hear. Oddly enough, there were some people climbing up into trees just trying to catch a glimpse of the trial. Maybe they were trying to catch a glimpse of what the man was saying. Then the leading council spoke up and said, Tell us what you have been saying to the people in the marketplace. Tell us so that we may judge whether or not it's okay or not okay. Tell us so that we can judge it whether or not it belongs in Athens or not. And if it is a new God, if it is a new idea, you know, most certainly we'd love to hear it. And the man clears his throat. He stands up. And the crowd gasped in surprise because you do not stand up before the court. The man stood up and said, I am Paul of Tarsus. I bring a message not so you can argue it, but I bring a message of peace and deliverance. The crowds, they, they began to erupt in shouting and back and forth bickering. Some were on the offensive trying to take Paul's side and all this. They don't even know what he was about to say, but they, they just wanted to side with him. A lot of us were, were defensive of him, trying to already position ourselves in a way that, that debates him. And some were just honestly ready just to fight. They're reaching for their daggers. They're getting their hands ready, popping their knuckles. And I could look around and the council members and, and some of them were just stroking their long white beards. Just, just kind of thinking over what Paul just said. And some of them were just shaking their heads. And the crowds continue to, to kind of shout and, and lead him on and, and kind of pressure him in to keep talking. And as the crowds got bigger, Paul still stood there and he began to speak. I, I couldn't really catch the, the beginning of his speech because the crowds were so loud, but as he continued to speak, the crowds silenced. It's almost as if the power of his voice calmed the crowd. He had this way about him, this, this voice that echoed across the hill, and everyone was tuned in to hear his voice. And so Paul continued. Men of Athens, I have been in your city for just over a week now. And all I can see here in this city is that it is full of gods. Everywhere I turn, there is another god. It's almost as if there's more gods in your city than there are people. And yeah, I've seen all your shrines. I even saw one that said, to an unknown God. Brothers, are you kidding me? An unknown God? You don't even know who you're praying to anymore. You don't even know. <laughs> Look at all you see here. The God that, you, that created all you see here, this hill, the land, the seas, the sky, the moon, the stars, everything, you and me, that God is not contained in a shrine or building or temple. He's not contained in anything built by human hands. 
Our God is not a created God. Our God created everything. Our God is an eternal God, even if he didn't even need, he doesn't need temples, he doesn't need shrines, he doesn't need anything that you can give him. He just needs your heart. Our God created you with his hands. Listen to your great poets of old, Eretus and Epimenides. They say, for in him we live and we have being. We are his offspring. But where your poets get it wrong is that they attributed these qualities to the created God of Zeus. But these qualities and these attributes should be attributed to the eternal God, the Father. Because we are God's creation, we have to turn to him. We have to follow him only. Friends, there is judgment coming. Turn from your idols. Turn from your wickedness. Turn from your evil ways. Stop throwing wasteless money at idols and statues that you've created with your own hands. Friends, judgment is coming. There'll be one day where you have to stand in front of God the Father and say, yes, I chose to follow man-made idols. But friends, there is hope. In and through Christ Jesus our Lord, he will bring you deliverance. In and through Christ Jesus our Lord, he will bring you salvation that only he can give you. Friends, I too was a skeptic. But we know this is true from the rising of himself from the dead. I too was a skeptic of such resurrection but I am now a follower and a believer, and I rejoice in the truth. Friends, turn to God. Again, the Oropagus erupted in shouting, Resurrection? Are you kidding me? Doesn't Paul know that these are Stoics and Epicureans here in the audience? These people believe that once you die, life is over. There's nothing for you. Resurrection? Are you kidding me? One God? What, where does he think he is? But then something started to change. Instead of finding the next arguments or the next points to debate him with, my brain shut off and my heart began to creep open. I began to feel things that I, haven't, that I haven't felt in, I guess, forever. It's almost as if someone had the key to my heart and opened it. I didn't even know it was closed. And as it was beginning to open, I could hear the council member shouting at him, telling him that he was wrong, telling him that he was, he was just spreading false false ideas very calmly he, he packed up his stuff and he was getting ready to go and I, and I turned to, to over to where this, this prominent female was Damaris for lack of a better term Damaris was a prostitute but she was on her knees weeping in joy and every once in a while through the tears she would scream I believe I believe and I looked back at Paul. Paul had his hand on his heart, looking up to the skies and saying, all praise to you, Jesus. And he looked down back at me and, and we locked eyes. And when we did, I just started bawling. And the overwhelming fe fear of not knowing what's happening inside me, the overwhelming emotions that my heart is finally open, brought me to my knees. And from my knees, I kept crying. And Paul came over to my side and put his hand on my shoulder. And he began to pray with me. And this prayer had power. 
It wasn't like the ones I do every morning. Every word of his prayer brought more and more feelings that that felt like it was going to burst from my chest. And when he finally said, amen, I wiped the tears from my eyes, regained composure, and looked up and see that he was gone. He left. And so I turned back to Tamaris, and Tamaris had a couple people that, that believed in the same resurrection as well. And so we all got together. We said, guys, what do we need to do now? And we all agreed we had to go find Paul. So we did. We looked in the marketplace. We looked everywhere. We looked, we looked down by the seashore. We looked in the inner city. We looked everywhere. And when we finally got back together, we said, guys, I don't know where to look next. And someone from the crowd said, hey, have you tried looking in the synagogue? I said, well, no, let's, let's, let's go try And so we ran as fast as we could. We actually ran this time to the synagogue where we found Paul there continuing to pray. So I walked up to him. He stood up and I said, I said, Paul, what what, what do we need to do to get this eternal life that you speak of? And he wrapped his big burly arm around my shoulder. He pointed to all of us and said, guys, let's go get you baptized we did I was made new in Christ that day and after that I was, I was so overcome with joy I, I ran home I threw away all my idols I threw away anything that had anything to do with anything but the God the Father I melted down the statues and I sold that for money gave that money to the poor those who needed it I told my wife about everything that had happened that day. And she believed too. Pretty soon I got to baptize her myself. It's been about three, four years since that happened. You know, Paul stuck around for a couple more weeks telling us all he knew about Jesus, all he knew about what's to come, but, but eventually Paul had to go. And after he left, some of us actually formed a little group and and we got together as much as we could to talk about Jesus, to talk about a newfound faith, to talk about the resurrection. But Paul never returned. Some of them left the faith, went back to their old ways because they had their faith in Paul, not Jesus. But the most... The most of us, the ones that stuck around, we, we grew in our faith in Christ. And we got stronger. See, sometimes you don't know what's, sometimes you don't know what you need until it hits you in the face. And even still, sometimes that's not even enough. I, th- I thank Paul every day for for his message of hope. You know, guys, I, I think I hear my wife calling me. You know what that means. But I will leave you with this. You know, after that experience, I, I went to the Oropagus and I quit my job. And I settled... I thrived with a life for Jesus. And on my way out, I I bent down and and grabbed a small little stone just right off the hill to remind myself every day whenever I reach in my pocket that you are God's creation. And if he can change a life like yours, he can change anyone. So go and spread it. And if I leave you with, with something, it's this. Open your heart to Jesus. Open your heart to see the life-changing power that is Jesus. And if for some reason you choose not to open it, let me let you in on a little secret. I'm wise. You can listen to me. He has a key. 
He used it on me, and he can use it on you. Yeah, she's really yelling now. It's hard to walk home six months pregnant. Today's the day we're supposed to build our crib. Life-changing power. All because he opened my heart. I'll see you next week.